Mr Donnelly. Thank you, Commissioner. We now move to uh, the next case study concerning Australian super, and I'll invite my learned friend, Mr O'Brien, to call Mr Peasley. O'Brien. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Peasley, would you stand? I ask you, uh, Mr Peasley, whether you'd prefer to be sworn or to make an affirmation? Uh, sworn, please, Commissioner. Do you mind standing, then, while the oath is administered? Do sit down. Thank you. Yes, Mr. O'Brien. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Mr. Peasley, is your full name Jason Robert Peasley? Yes. yes. And is your business address Level 26, 50 Lonsdale Street, Melbourne? Yes. yes. And is your uh, current position Head of Mid Risk Portfolios at Australian Super Proprietary Limited? Correct. Yes. Uh, Mr. Peasley, have you received a summons dated? 31 July 2018 to give evidence and to produce your signed witness statement? Yes. yes. Do you have, a, have that summons with you there? Yes, I do. Yes. Um, I, I tender that summons, Commissioner. Uh, exhibit 5.61, uh, summons to Mr Peasley. And Mr Peasley, have you made a witness statement dated 1 August 2018 in response to the Royal Commission's rubric 5-72? Yes. yes. And do you have that, uh, the original of that witness statement with you in the witness box? Yes, I do. Yes. And uh, Mr Peasley, is there one correction you wish to make to that uh, witness statement? Yes, there is. Um, would you turn to page four uh, of that witness statement? And in the table, Beneath paragraph 4.2, uh, in the last row of that table opposite the date 31 March 2016, in the third column, uh, do you wish to correct that the figure of 0.60% to 0.43%? Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, Commissioner, is the practice for Mr Peasley to hand mark make, that statement? Make the amendment yes. and yes. initial it, please. Yes, thank you, Mr Peasley, if you would do that. And with that correction, Mr Peasley, are the contents of that witness statement true and correct to the best of your knowledge? Yes, they are. I tender that witness statement and the annexures to it, Commissioner. Exhibit 5.62, witness statement of Mr Peasley, 1 August 18, and uh, annexures. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Yes, Mr Donnelly. Thank you, Commissioner. Good afternoon, Mr Peasley. My name's Albert Donnelly and I'm one of the council assisting the Commission. I understand your role at Australian Super is head of mid-risk portfolios, is that right? Yes, correct. Um, can you explain to the Commissioner, please, Mr Peasley, what that role involves? Uh, as a portfolio head, I'm responsible for the overall uh, coordination and implementation of portfolio strategies involving the asset classes of infrastructure, uh, property and credit. Uh, and the, the term mid-risk, can you explain how that is to be uh, differentiated between low risk and high risk? Uh, certainly so. We would characterise uh, low-risk portfolios or asset classes to be cash and fixed income in nature and like, uh, and the higher-risk uh, portfolios being the likes of equity and uh, private equity. Uh, and, in, uh, and in your role as the head of mid-risk portfolios, um, who do you report to? I report to the Chief Investment Officer, Mark Delaney. And uh, I understand you have a number of staff that assist you. How many staff assist you in your, in your role? In the current role, there's approximately 30 people in the mid-risk portfolio teams. Uh, and uncontroversially, with the, ev the evidence of your colleague, Mr Silk, uh, will be that as at 30 June 2017, there was approximately $120 billion of fund under management in, in the fund. That sounds correct, yes. Uh, and in fact, there will be further evidence tendered from a, uh, one of your colleagues, Mr Schroeder, uh, who says that it's now actually some uh, 
one year later, approximately $140 billion? Yes, that sounds correct. Uh, and what proportion of those funds would be part of the mid-risk portfolio? Uh, the mid-risk portfolio is currently uh, approximately uh, $28 billion. Uh, so that would make it roughly, as percentage terms, um, 22, 23% uh, in, in broad whole of fund terms. Thank you. Now, Australian Super was asked to provide a statement to the Commission dealing with various questions it wished to explore regarding Australian Super's investment in Pacific Hydro via a fund manager, Industry Funds Management. And your statement does that. Can you explain perhaps to the Commissioner what Pacific Hydro is? Certainly. So, uh, Pacific Hydro at the time uh, was a renewables development and operating company. Uh, it was initially uh, publicly listed and then taken private by IFM in 2005, um, whereby it developed uh, wind renewable farms and hydro generation assets in Australia, Chile, and uh, uh, one small asset in Brazil. And am I right to say that during the time that it formed part of Australian Super's fund, and I'll, I'll let you explain shortly that it was an indirect investment, but am I right to say that it was one of Australian Super's largest company exposures during the time that Australian Super invested in it? So at the time that I joined in 2011, uh, it was uh, probably in the top five of uh, what we'd call single asset exposures uh, within the Australian Super portfolio. Uh, that is correct. Now Pacific Hydro, you, you indicate in your statement, was an indirect investment through industry funds management, which you've already referred to, or IFM. Uh, can you explain please to the Commissioner what IFM is? So IFM is a uh, fund manager uh, who uh, offer as an investment product a portfolio um, which comprises uh, infrastructure investments. And so Australian Super's investment uh, is the investment in the portfolio that is the Australian Infrastructure Fund. Uh, and that fund of itself uh, owns uh, percentages of various equity stakes in various infrastructure assets throughout Australia. Uh, you give some examples in your statement, I think, of the sort of uh, assets that uh, IFM um, has invested in through the Infrastructure Fund. What sort of assets are they? Um, broadly in sector terms, uh, airports, toll roads, um, power networks, uh, ports and specific examples include uh, the Port of Brisbane, uh, small stakes or partial ownership stakes in Melbourne Airport, Adelaide Airport, um, Eastern Distributor in Sydney, the M5, uh, toll road in Sydney, uh, Brisbane Airport um, and also a small suite of uh, equity stakes in public private partnership projects. Um, Thank you, Mr. Priestley. Now, IFM invests obviously on behalf of a, uh, a number of entities. Um, it, it might assist to explain the background to IFM to the extent you're able uh, and the nature of those who perhaps initially invested in their funds and those that presently invest in their funds. Uh, so, to the best of my knowledge, the history is that IFM was formed in 1995 uh, by Australian industry funds. The investment rationale for that was at the time the industry funds identified uh, owning directly Australian infrastructure assets as an attractive uh, suite of assets to hold for superannuation members over the long term. The challenge with doing so is that infrastructure assets are quite uh, large in size uh, and therefore the funds, the, the superannuation funds needed to pool their resources and capital uh, in order to be able to participate in that investment opportunity. That led to the formation of IFM, uh, which acted on its behalf, amongst other fund managers at the time, uh, in seeking to acquire infrastructure assets on behalf of the initial investors, being industry funds. Over time, IFM has proven to be very successful as a fund manager. Uh, so by way of example, it currently manages approximately 100 billion Australian dollars of institutional capital. There are some 200 clients, we understand, of IFM, uh, and they are obviously now uh, broader than just industry funds, they're Australian and indeed global institutional investors. Thank you. And does Australian Super itself have an interest aside from the interest in the funds in IFM? Uh, yes, Australian Super has an interest in the sense that it is a part owner of ISH, which is the holding entity of uh, IFM. And 
is I'd like to focus, if I may, on the infrastructure fund in which, as I understand it, Pacific Hydro was held. Uh, in relation to the decisions that are made in relation to the infrastructure fund, uh, it's, those decisions are made by IFM, is that right? That is correct. Um, and is the fund, uh, is, and forgive me, there's a number of funds here, I'll refer to uh, the IFM infrastructure fund as infrastructure fund and the fund um, as and the Australian super uh, fund. Is the fund, that is Australian super, consulted on decisions that are made by IFM? Uh, no, it's general practice that um, the manager who has the discretion to invest uh, capital uh, that the fund has uh, makes those decisions and investors are informed of those decisions after the event. And you give evidence to, to that effect in your statement. But can I ask, that being the case, what um, oversight is in place via your role or the roles of others at Australian Super in relation to the oversight of decisions that are made by the Infrastructure Fund? So as a starting point, um, the reason uh, investors like Australian Super would give capital to a manager like IFM is that it has the skill to implement a stated investment strategy and it has the processes in place to do so with respect to its own internal um, expertise decision-making processes. Uh, therefore, the oversight given by a fund such as Australian Super, an investor such as Australian Super, uh, would be through the regular engagement, uh, structured engagement uh, and reporting that is part of the duty of the manager uh, to the fund investors. There's regular quarterly reporting, uh, there's uh, provision of monthly valuation unit pricing statements, um, there's formal uh, meetings, presentations of the manager, uh, and in some cases there's also uh, formal committees that um, some of the investors uh, can be invited to attend. All of those uh, forums uh, and forms of reporting uh, provide information to the investors that allow them to engage with the manager to understand that the manager is executing in accordance with their stated investment strategy uh, and that they're carrying out their duty in managing the fund to the best of their abilities for the benefit of the investors. On top of those formal arrangements, there's also the opportunity for informal engagement. Uh, I guess you could say at the, at the pleasure of the investor. Um, and so that form of informal engagement at an executive level is something that we would undertake uh, on a regular ad hoc basis uh, throughout uh, the time that I've been with Australian Super. And are you, in your role as the head of mid-risk portfolio, the contact person for IFM in relation to its infrastructure fund specifically? Uh, in my former role as head of infrastructure, that was my direct responsibility and I sought to have that direct engagement alongside uh, several of my colleagues. Uh, as we stand here today, uh, one of my direct reports is the, is the Head of Infrastructure, and so he has that duty currently. I didn't explore that with you, but it does appear from some of the documents I'm about to take you to that you were the Head of Infrastructure for a period, that is from when you started Australian Super in 2011 until your promotion. When were you promoted to the role that you currently have? Uh, December 2016. So from 2011 to 2016, uh, which is the time frame which we're concerned with today, uh, you were in the role of the Head of Infrastructure, is that correct? Yes, correct. And so it was your responsibility as part of that to be the contact person for IFM in relation to the Infrastructure Fund? Uh, yes, as the person responsible for the portfolio, um, I would just note that there was multiple contact points between the two organisations um, <coughs> within my team and, and more broadly across the investment department. And you've indicated that various uh, report, reports were given on a formal and informal basis, and you referred to quarterly reports that were given. When those reports uh, were given to uh, Australian Super, what did Australian Super, what did your team do with those reports and how did it uh, deal with any issues raised by them within Australian Super? So as a standard uh, approach, uh, we would digest the information provided by the manager. Uh, usually those quarterly reports are accompanied by quarterly presentations held by the manager that we would attend, have the opportunity to engage in that forum. Um, if there's nothing particularly controversial or new in those reports, they may well just be filed and to the extent necessary, we may report upon it in the regular reporting that we have internally to our own investment committee. Um, if there are more 
If there are new or unusual matters or matters of particular concern to us, we may seek to elevate the engagement or activity around that particular issue in order to understand it, uh, potentially to engage or convey a view on that uh, to the manager and indeed up uh, through our internal reporting process to the investment committee. Um, it is by and large an engagement function uh, that we seek to undertake, recognising where the duties and the responsibilities of that uh, fund uh, lie. Uh, and when you say, uh, I think you used the word elevate, I think you were using in the context of elevating it within uh, if there is an issue with IFM, um, that would be something that would be raised by you um, or would it be raised uh, by a member of the investment committee with IFM? Uh, so uh, we would seek to engage directly with the infrastructure team within IFM who are responsible for the Australian Infrastructure Fund. Um, it is quite possible and indeed it has been the case uh, that uh, my senior colleagues have also engaged directly with IFM on matters pertaining to that particular fund. Can I come to Pacific Hydro? Hydro, As I understand it, and you've given evidence that um, IFM wholly acquired Pacific Hydro in 2005. Um, during, you started, of course, with the business in 2011. To the extent you can, can you assist the Commission by explaining broadly about the general performance of Pacific Hydro during, uh, during the time that you've been with Australian Super? So having joined in 2011, we did undertake a review of that asset. Uh, at that point in time, uh, it had underperformed what we'd say was their original investment case, um, albeit um, still performing at a reasonable return in our mind of, I think it was eight or nine per cent if I can recall. Uh, since that point, until about 2014, um, the return had been uh, mediocre, I would say, uh, and required uh, a level of regular engagement between the manager and investors as a result of that. Overall, um, going right back to when part of the stake was acquired by IFM in 1995, uh, the return from first ownership to last ownership uh, was uh, as we understand it, 7.2% um, from an IFM fund level point of view, if that makes sense. Thank you. Perhaps we can go to some of those uh, matters in just a little bit more detail, if I may. Your evidence was that you did a review soon after starting with um, Australian Super. When did you start with Australian Super in 2011? Uh, early 2011, I think April or May from memory. Uh, and. It must have been then soon after your appointment that you prepared um, the paper, which is JRP 6.1, which I might ask be called up, which is ASU.0018.0001.0021. And you prepared this paper on the 7th of June 2011? That's correct. Um, and you prepared it with, what I assume, two of your colleagues? That's whose correct. names are there. And can you explain why uh, this paper was prepared by you and your colleagues for the investment committee? Certainly. So the catalyst at that time was um, that there was a refinancing occurring with respect to the asset. Uh, and at that time, we were a financier of the particular instrument in question. Uh, there was also a restructure. I'm sorry, I missed the last sentence. I'm sorry. We were a financier of a particular yeah. subordinated note facility that was a subject of a refinancing. Uh, the second reason was there was a restructure proposal with respect to the ownership of Pacific Hydro uh, being put by the manager to the AIF investors at that time. And the third Australian super specific reason was it was a large exposure, uh, one of the largest exposures within Australian super. Uh, it had not performed as originally expected. Uh, and I was asked to perform a deep dive analysis to better understand the nature of that investment and our exposure to it. In, in, in paragraph 1.2, you say that the review has been undertaken for two reasons, and I understand this is what um, summarised what you said. One was the concern over the size, both current and prospective, risk profile and return volatility associated with our indirect investment in Pacific Hydro, and two, to assess two proposals made by IFM in respect of Pacific Hydro being a refinancing of an investor-funded subordinated note facility and a restructure proposal which will materially alter the way in which our investment in Pacific Hydro is to be held. 
Correct. And you noted there um, at paragraph 2.1 that Pacific Hydro has underperformed its original acquisition case to date, both operationally and in investment performance. Originally forecast um, sorry, originally forecast to complete 875 of new projects with 548 million of new investor equity and generating free crash flow by 2010. Uh, can, just pausing there, was the fact that it wasn't generating that free cash flow by that time what prompted this work? Uh, I think that was one of the reasons. So by not having met its original acquisition case, it was not performing in an investment sense as expected. Uh, and that was uh, leading to uh, a review of the asset because of its underperformance from an investment point of view. Is that a common, moving away from Pacific Hydro for a moment, is that a common uh, task in your role to do an evaluation of that type? Um, it's an unfortunate hazard of investing that we do tend to get things wrong sometimes and underinvest, uh, underperform specific investments. When that's the case, we do have a process in place that seeks to understand uh, the source of that underperformance and determine whether action, to the extent we could take action, uh, should be taken um, with respect to uh, the fact we have the investment um, and what would be the best course of action having regard to uh, the best outcome for the use of those invest that invested capital. If I could just go ahead to point zero zero three zero. You and your colleagues prepared this paper and set out then at paragraph 6.1 some recommendations. And summarising those, the first was that you would support the proposed refinancing of the existing RECN, which is the, the note um, to which you've made reference on the proposed terms of um, the new note and rolling over our existing investment in the current facility um, and rejecting the proposed ownership restructure of Pacific Hydro on the terms proposed. Uh, three, reducing our exposure to Pacific Hydro over a determined period of time to a level which allows the Australian super portfolio to adequately absorb the risk and volatility inherent in the underlying business. Can you explain in a little bit more detail that third point? What was intended by your recommendation uh, in, in this paper to the investment committee? So having regard to the, the potential earnings volatility of the asset by its nature and being a generation asset, uh, that gave rise to a level of volatility when you work through the performance consequences um, for, with respect to our, our indirect investment in that. Uh, and given it was one of the largest single asset exposures to the fund, uh, it was our recommendation that it would be prudent to see that exposure size reduce and therefore the volatility or potential performance impact uh, on our fund reduce accordingly. And the fourth point is that you recommended formally approaching IFM to put forward our preferred position and seeking a framework designed to produce a long-term solution which satisfies the objectives of all stakeholders. It was your earlier evidence that generally IFM or the fund manager makes the decisions. What prompted you to approach IFM in this particular case? Um, so, uh, was that for you to recommend that that be the case? We'll come to what actually happened in a moment. So, yes, of course, it's true that it's the manager's responsibility. Having said that, um, we don't uh, necessarily uh, sit passively if we have a particular view. Uh, we had a view that we felt re reflected the best interest of our members and we felt uh, a duty to engage with the manager and convey those views accordingly uh, in an attempt to seek some sense of <coughs> alignment or outcome that we felt was the best interest for our fund members. And after that recommendation had been made in your paper, uh, what, what occurred? So there were... Um, several conversations with IFM uh, involving various uh, members of Australian Super, where we put uh, our views and concerns of the asset and its potential investment performance to them. Uh, and that was certainly heard by the manager. Uh, the manager responded with respect to acknowledging our views, um, with respect to our position on a particular restructure 
uh, that have been put forward by the manager, which we were not supporting. Um, and as a result of our position of not supporting the restructure, that particular um, initiative um, ceased. And am I right that ultimately Australian Super determined that it was um, that it wished to reduce its exposure to Pacific Hydro? So that certainly remained the case, and that view was conveyed to the manager uh, on several occasions throughout those engagements. Uh, and when you say throughout those engagements, is that the reference to the various meetings that you had in the period after you wrote your paper? Correct, and the formal communication as late as, I think, November that year. In fact, I think you might be referring to 6.4, Exhibit JRP 6.4, which is a letter dated the 19th of December 2011. Yes, correct. Which is ASU.0018.0001.0076. And when you, ref when you said previously there was a formal notification, is that what you were referring to, Mr Yes, Peter? correct. Uh, and you say there, or at least Mr Delaney, who's the Chief Investment Officer, says, we are writing to confirm earlier, verb um, earlier verbal of Australian Super's position with respect to its economic interest in Pacific Hydro via IFM's Australian Infrastructure Fund, and then setting out that it's what you've already given evidence about the size of that um, exposure, and you then say, oh, sorry, Mr Delaney says in the second last substantive paragraph, from this analysis the Investment Committee has concluded that we wish to reduce our exposure to Pacific Hydro over a time in a way which does not harm the value of our investment. Um, perhaps you can assist there. Why? It's obvious, of course, why you wouldn't want to uh, harm the value of your investment, but why was that a necessary matter to raise in this correspondence with, with IFM um, about reducing one's exposure? Um, I'll try to answer it this way. So, recognising the nature of the fund, uh, and it was within the manager's discretion to determine how it wishes to deal with that investment, there was also a practical reality as to what it could do with respect to that investment in the sense that um, what can you do? Can you improve the operational performance? Do you sell the investment? And the inference being there that one way to reduce the exposure is uh, encourage them to sell the investment. But by doing so, if that uh, is detrimental to investors, because for instance, you can't realise the value that you think is fair, uh, then that would be against the interests of all investors in the fund. It would be against the duty, the fiduciary duty of the manager to do such a thing. So it was recognising, I think, um, implicitly recognising the duty of the manager to all investors, uh, but trying to convey our concern and seek to find a way that uh, all stakeholder interests could be could be aligned. Was it a, was it a particular moment the fact that it, that Pacific Hydro was wholly owned by the infrastructure fund? I'm sorry. Can you repeat? Was the it a particular moment? Was it particularly important that, uh, in terms of this particular aspect, that it was wholly owned by the infrastructure fund? As far as a decision by the manager to sell an investment, I don't think the percentage ownership of the underlying investment is fundamental to that. So if they all own a portion of the business, they could still elect to sell a portion of the equity. <coughs> so I don't think that was determinative to, to seeking to sell the business. And the letter then goes on to say, as manager of the Australian Infrastructure Fund and by extension Pacific Hydro, we are seeking your guidance and leadership in the development of a strategic plan which facilitates the objectives of all stakeholders, including the specific objectives of Australian Super. Yes, correct. Now, your statement, which deals with Pacific Hydro, deals with, if I, if I may say, two parts, that is, this sort of first period when you started with Australian Super. And the next period I'd like to deal with is 2014, to which you've already made brief reference. But your statement says nothing about what happened in the period in between. Um, was there ever uh, a response to this letter to IFM um, that was sent by Mr Delaney? Uh, I can't recall um, seeing a, a formal response. 
uh, the, the engagement with the manager through both our regular um, periodic engagement and ad hoc um, ensured that Pacific Hydro was a, a regular topic of conversation. The natural conclusion uh, out of this exercise was that uh, the proposed restructure did not go ahead. Uh, a refinancing went ahead, but with other providers of the subordinated note, to the best of my recollection, and the ownership remained um, within the fund, um, and um, we remain regularly engaged with the manager on the performance uh, of that investment um, thereafter. And I take it that you had your regular reporting done and your regular analysis within your team during 2012 and 2013? We, we did, and I would also note that um, through that period, the, the engagement and disclosure of information pertaining to that asset uh, was elevated by the manager. Uh, so we were provided direct presentations by the management of Pacific Hydro. Um, all ad hoc requests concerning the asset were responded to by the manager. Uh, and so there was, I would say, uh, a much uh, a more transparent and, and heavier level of engagement and information pertaining to the asset over that period of time. And in 2014, to which you've already referred, I understand uh, that there was a material de deterioration in, in Pacific Hydro's value, and you deal with this in your statement. It might be useful to ask uh, for paragraph 4.1 to be brought up of your statement, which is ASU.0018.0001.0365. At 0368. Just to put this in, in context, previously you'd given evidence about the. Uh, sorry, previously in your statement you'd uh, explained the market value of the investment in the infrastructure fund by Australian Super as a percentage. Um, and you can go to your statement if it would assist, but as a percentage, what percentage of the Australian super fund was invested in the infrastructure fund? Uh, so as at uh, 30 June 2013, uh, the total weight of the Australian infrastructure fund in our fund assets was 3.55%. Uh, and a proportion of that then, and coming to Pacific Hydro, a proportion of that was then the exposure to Pacific Hydro itself? That's correct. Uh, and can you explain perhaps uh, the, <coughs> what did occur during 2014 and the deterioration to which you refer 4.1 of your um, statement? Certainly. And for clarity, back in 2011, the implied exposure that the fund had to Pacific Hydro was approximately 1.8%. Uh, so in 2014, the um, business uh, or the investment uh, suffered a series of devaluations as a result of a deteriorated outlook with respect to the market that it operated in. That is, the future expected price of electricity declined. Uh, there was also issues with the potential volume output that the uh, assets could generate. Uh, there was also uh, a number of other external factors uh, pertaining to the value of renewable energy certificates, which these assets generated and were of value and could be sold on the market. Uh, there was also uh, changes in Chile to uh, tax policy, which had adverse impacts on owners. I think, in my recollection, serves foreign owners particularly of assets. Um, and there are also consequential impacts pertaining to the operations of the business that led to a revaluation as to the costs of running the business. And all of these things colluded to uh, a lower valuation based on a lower future expected earnings to be derived from the assets. And in fact, it was a very, as, as you say, uh, a material deterioration, but in fact, a very significant one. It was indeed significant, yes. Uh, and No doubt in your role as, uh, at the time, having responsibility for infrastructure, this was of great concern to you. Indeed, yes. Um, and you prepared a paper, if I, um, if, if I can take you to ASU.0009.0004.1454,
You won't find this in your materials, Mr Peasley, um, but it's a document dated the 8th of July 2014, which is just being called up. We have the number again, Mr Donnelly. It's uh, AS 009 004. What's the last four digits? 1545. 1545. And I take it this was a document that you prepared for an investment committee rate meeting, is that correct? Yes, so this would be our standard portfolio report that we submit to each investment committee. And I think we'd earlier gone to one that you'd written with two of your colleagues, um, Ms Finlay and Ms. Mr Berger. This one had been written by you and quite a number more of your colleagues um, on the 8th of July 2014, is that right? That's correct. Uh, and. At paragraph one, you set out the strategy of uh, the infrastructure portfolio, and you say that they are to deliver low double-digit returns, bonds plus four percent, with low volatility and low fees. The portfolio strategy advocates the predominant use of direct investment techniques for new investment opportunities, given their comparative advantages over pooled investment structures, namely, facilitates portfolio construction decisions within Australian super, facilitates our preferred risk exposure and scope of the portfolio's investment mandate, reduces costs and improves liquidity. That strategy that you described there, is that a strategy that's consistent with the strategy now? Yes, it is. And was it the case that um, there was a move towards more direct investments rather than indirect investments of the type we're here discussing? Uh, yes, so since about that time, we have sought to introduce that uh, capability and aspect into our strategy. And why, uh, well, you identify some of the, um, the reasons, but why is that of, um, of benefit to Australian Super and why is Australian Super able to do that? So the broad uh, portfolio strategy, um, I'll take a step back. So. Uh, the nature of the asset class, it's not something that's easily transactable. There's no stock exchange that we could um, make investments or divestments from. Um, and I've mentioned the difficulty in securing very large um, assets. Um, from our point of view, uh, Australian Super, through the benefits of scale that it had developed, afforded us the ability to um, bring in internal capability and start to engage directly in the marketplace under our own name. Uh, that had certain advantages for us in the sense that it brought the investment decision closer to the members and therefore in the context of the overall funds through which the members invest and we felt that would be supportive to uh, making the right overall decisions over a long period of time. <clears throat> it also afforded us the ability to do it on a more cost effective basis than using external agents. Having said that, we could not easily replicate external agents. They're well-established platforms uh, with skill and expertise that we did not have. And so evolving a portfolio that would have a combination of both the pooled fund uh, investments and direct investments would allow us to continue to have access to the underlying existing exposures we had, the expertise of certain managers, and complement complement that with uh, our own direct engagement with the marketplace that gave us sufficient control over our portfolio construction at a lower cost, which we felt would benefit members. If I can just jump ahead to 1547, where you deal specifically with Pacific Hydro. You note there that the value of Pacific Hydro decreased by 307 million or 18.2% before hedging in June. Um, that's quite a significant decrease in that period of time. That is significant, yes. Uh, and you then go on um, to identify towards the bottom of the page Pacific Hydro having requested a funding support package which comprised a, a cash injection, a $200 million cash injection. And over the page, um, a deferral of a repayment of insurance proceeds of $13 million and extension of a standby facility to 2022. Uh, they were obviously significant um, 
or a significant request for a funding package at that time? Uh, yes, so obviously there was a confluence of events at that point in time which created a liquidity issue uh, with respect to the operations of the business um, and some of those uh, events were outlined in part in that paragraph. And the committee did agree to that funding as I understand it? Uh, the, the IFM? The, sorry, the, the IFM Investment Committee um, had agreed that funding would be a, available for, uh, for that but there were certain conditions which were placed on it? Uh, yes, that's my understanding. Uh, and um, that was to be done by um, IFM, that is a, a review by their new CEO? Uh, correct. So um, obviously the, the investment performance was significant and that was of significant concern to the manager. Uh, the manager in assessing the situation and providing that funding um, has rightly um, sought to take action and we listed there um, that involved undertaking a strategic review uh, of the business, um, providing the funding um, and um, putting a cap on new capital expenditure uh, until such matters are complete. And what role did Australian Super play in, um, in that review? Uh, so, um, as obviously a large investor and a concerned investor, we engaged with the manager. Um, we sought to outline the specific areas that we felt the strategic re review should look to undertake. I would say, um, I guess pleasingly, at least in the, the circumstances, the manager had already initiated many of the aspects of the review that we felt were important, uh, and that had afforded us the ability to monitor and engage with them as they undertook that process. If you go back to what, the next page, 1549, where it says um, the portfolio team, so about 0 0.6 of the page, the portfolio team considers the key issues which should be addressed are, uh, it might actually be the one above that, um, with the five dot points. When you refer there to the portfolio team, though, you're referring to Australian Super's portfolio team? Yes, that was Of which opinion. you were the head at the time? That's correct. Uh, and these were particular issues. Why were you concerned about particular issues such as governance and forecast, sustainability of the business, the options for the business and the options for ownership? Why were you, were you keen to ensure that those key issues were addressed? So given the state of the business at that time, in short, we wanted to see all options were on the table uh, to make sure the, the business or we could realise the best possible outcome uh, from that situation for our members. Uh, and they were the areas that we felt needed to be assessed in order to, us in order to inform uh, whether the business was viable as an investment going forward, whether it should be sold uh, and more valuable in the hands of a third party. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, if I can tender that document, if I may. Exhibit 5.63, Australian Super Investment Committee Infrastructure Portfolio Activity Report, 15 July 14, ASU 0009 0004 1545. That'd be the 8th of July. 8th of July, was it? Commissioner. I was reading the footer. No. Oh, very. <laughs> You're right. One of the two, I think, Commissioner. The date at the top does appear to be the 8th. And, um, sorry, Mr Peasley, then, a letter was ultimately sent um, by Australian Super to IFM, wasn't it? That's correct. Um, and that is at JRP 6.5, ASU.0018.0001.0001. And that set out Australian Super's expectation of the review that was being done by IFM, is that right? That's correct. And is it common, moving away from Pacific Hydro for a moment, but is it common for you to, uh, in circumstances where there's a review or ongoing work being done in, in relation to a particular investment for Australian Super to write to a fund, to, sorry, to a fund manager and, uh, and make such matters clear? Uh, it's not at all common, uh, but this was not at all a common circumstance. Uh, and was that, uh, and I assume you say that because of the evidence you've given previously about the very significant deterioration in the value? That's correct. Uh, and you individually, when you wrote that letter and as part of your portfolio team, took the view that it was important to put this in, in writing to IFM? 
uh, the letter was written by our Chief Investment Officer, Mark Delaney. Um, but yes, we certainly had input into the drafting of that letter and we felt it important to make sure this was formally tabled to IFM uh, as we felt it was important uh, to protect as best we could uh, our investment uh, in uh, the RAF fund. And in fact, it does pick up, doesn't it, the matters that you had in your earlier, um, the document we went to a moment ago in your earlier report. It does so indeed, I and it does also note that it um, is covering areas that the manager ha had already indicated would be undertaken as part of its review. Thank you. And no doubt you were spending considerable time on this particular issue in around this time in 2014? Yes, that's correct. And you prepared another report for the Investment Committee on the, sorry, perhaps I'll give the number, ASU.0009.0003.850. Now, perhaps you can assist uh, me and others, perhaps. This does appear to be dated the 5th of September 2014, but much like the other document, it um, has a different date. Is that because the different date in the footer is when the committee meeting is being held? I'm, I'm sorry about that. The practice, one is the time the paper's submitted, the other is the scheduled date of the committee meeting. I see. So this was prepared for the meeting on the 12th of September, but a week prior, you and your colleagues had, uh, had prepared the document. Correct. Uh, and if you go to the second page of that document, uh, again, you'll see that a heading Pacific Hydro 4.1, uh, the strate strategic review of Pacific Hydro being undertaken by the new CEO and the IFM team is approximately 50% complete. Australian Super and other investors have met with the IFM review team on at least two occasions since the review commenced. Were you part of those meetings at the time? Uh, I don't have specific recollection, but I expect I would have been in my uh, capacity of my role. And in fact, is it fair to say that you would have become, during the course of this review, even more concerned about your investment in Pacific Hydro? Uh, I think at that point in time, uh, we probably knew, we thought we knew all we needed to or what was to be known about the investment in Pacific Hydro. Um, I recall that we were focused on the actions the manager was taking at the time, the thoroughness of the review that they were undertaking uh, to ensure that we got to the right outcome on a fully informed basis. Uh, and that was generally the basis of those, those early engagements to understand what the manager was doing uh, and being comfortable that it was going to produce the best possible outcome in the situation. Well, in fact, the next paragraph, though, does suggest that um, IFM had confirmed... It will, sorry, perhaps I'll read what it says, it has been confirmed by IFM that in the absence of shareholder support approved by IFM in July, Pacific Hydro would be technically insolvent? Yes, that's what we were informed. Uh, and You then go on in this paper to say that IFM will be attending the investment committee meeting to address any committee questions and provide a verbal update of various matters, including the review? Yes, that's correct. And was that something that you um, required of IFM to attend um, the investment committee meeting for that purpose? Uh, I can't res recall who specifically made the request. I expect it would have been made at the request of the investment committee uh, or indeed agreed by senior executives of the investment staff to make that request on behalf of the investment committee. Thank you, Commissioner. Can I tender that document, please? Australian Super Investment Committee Infrastructure Portfolio Activity Report, 12 July 14, ASU 0009 0038505, Exhibit 5.64. Thank you, Commissioner. So these very significant issues in relation to the Pacific Hydro investment um, had been raised by you with the Investment Committee. They were also elevated to the Board of Australian Super. Uh, so, subsequent to the events, yes, I've seen board papers which uh, reference the situation. And can I take you to, if I may, um, a further document, which is a paper of your then and, and present CEO, Ian Silk, 
It is ASU.0009.0002.71. And this is his chief executive report dated the 20th of October 2014 in advance of the October board meeting. And perhaps if I can go to page two. An issue was raised by Mr Silk under uh, paragraph 5.1 about the negative publicity surrounding the Pacific Hydro write down, he identifies that issue and he goes on then in the last four lines to say, the Pacific Hydro case has been cited as an example of ideological investment that has occurred to the detriment of industry fund members. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And what do you say to that issue that was raised there by Mr Sill? Uh, it would be difficult for me to comment on the decision made by a third party in 1995 and 2005. I would observe uh, by my engagement with IFM since 2011, and indeed prior, by being an industry participant, that they are particularly hard-nosed people um, with respect to making infrastructure investments and, and managing those investments. Um, I don't get the impression at all that they make investments for ideological reasons. Uh, Commissioner, can I tender the Chief Executive Report of Ian Silk? Chief Executive Report, Australian Super Board, 20 October 14, ASU 0009 0002 7126, uh, Exhibit 5.65. Uh, You prepared another report later that year in December, ASU.0009.0003.5773. Um, on the 1st of December 2014, in anticipation of the investment committee meeting the week after. Uh, and on 5775, you note well, you and your co-authors note at 5.1. The internal IFM team has completed its report on the Pacific Hydro review. We will receive it in the second week of December. It will provide options and recommendations for the future. Do you see that? Uh, yes. Now, I won't take you to that report because it's a subject of uh, a confidentiality order, but uh, you then see uh, in the next paragraph that Gary Weaven, can you assist by explaining who, who he is? Who he, is? Uh, he was the chair of uh, IFM Investors. And he's advised that invest, investors in the, the fund that he, Mr Coffey and Mr Himbury uh, will be, Mr Himbury of course is the CEO who your colleague, the Chief Investment Officer had written to previously. That's correct. Uh, will be resigning from the board of Pacific Hydro to facilitate the appointment of new directors by IFM. Yes. Uh, and it, it, state, it then goes on to say, he states that as much as 18 months to two years ago, the board arguably could have judged that the changing political climate in both Australia and Chile in different ways would have had severe impact on the value of Pacific Hydro. See that? Yes. Uh, and equally, they could have more strenuously questioned the energy demand forecast that the Australian energy market operated and the discount rate applied by the independent valuer and they did not foresee the manner in which a range of factors could conspire to have such a dramatic compounding impact on valuation. Had they done so, they could have arranged an asset sale at a price well above the current valuation. Yes. And it's for that reason, in order to enhance investor confidence for the future, the IFM infrastructure management team was asked to conduct a search for new directors, including a new chairman and a new chairman of audit, risk and finance. IFM will be able to appoint these directors as soon as it has determined the preferred future structure and direction of Pacific Hydro. And was that an appropriate response in um, your view from, from IFM after having done its work? Uh, so um, I don't think we were aware at the time of the work that was complete. We were aware that I think they had completed their report. 
Um, <clears throat> and so I think in those situations, uh, you would look back and assess the, the governance and capability of management and board uh, over that time to see whether they made the right decisions or not. Um, taking accountability uh, for the responsibility uh, that they had uh, and seeking to renew the board, uh, having regard to the findings that the review had identified at the time um, was certainly an appropriate step to take. Um, and so we were supportive to have seen that outcome. Uh, Commissioner, if I could tender that. Um, 5.66, Australian Super Investment Committee Infrastructure Portfolio Activity Report, 1 December 14, uh, ASU, 0009, 0003, uh, 5773. Thank you, Commissioner. And you continued then to report to the Investment Committee over the um, following year as well, didn't you, Mr Paisley? That's correct. Um, and I won't take you to that further report, but I will take you back to your statement, if I may, to paragraph 4.2, which is on page 0368. And you say there that the fund successfully dis disposed of Pacific Hydro in 2016 on terms which delivered pre-tax proceeds to the fund of two point, sorry, $2,230 million? Uh, yes, so proceeds, pre-tax proceeds to the AIF fund of uh, $2.23 billion. Correct. Uh, and, um, of course, a percentage of which was... Uh, was uh, which our investor would savings. be the beneficiary of, yes. Correct. Uh, and when you referred before to an internal rate of return of approximately seven point, when, when you referred to 7.2% before, was that to the, the figure in this paragraph, that is the sale proceeds significantly exceeded the valuation of Pacific Hydro prior to its write downs and generated an overall internal rate of return of approximately 7.2% over the life of the investment? That's correct. Can I take you to one um, perhaps final document, if I may, uh, which is another of your reports, albeit, uh, bear with me. Uh, ASU dot triple zero nine dot triple zero four dot five three nine one this is only an, a, a, um, an appendix um, but it's to a paper that was put to the investment committee meeting on the 22nd of March 2016 you have to look on the screen, I think, Mr. Paisley. Yes. Uh, and this, uh, what was the purpose of this document being prepared for the investment committee? So that was following the completion of the sale uh, of Pacific Hydro by IFM investors uh, and allowed us to provide a, a look back assessment um, on, uh, on that process um, and the lessons learned and the, the consequences for our investment in AIF. And is that, is that a common um, procedure once there's a sale of a, an asset to prepare a document like this for the investment committee? Uh, I wouldn't say common, but given the history that had gone on with respect to that investment uh, and the scrutiny that it attracted by uh, ourselves and our committee uh, and indeed by IFM and other investors, uh, we felt uh, it important to uh, highlight the outcomes and particularly given uh, there were salient lessons to be learned by us and by the manager uh, and particularly because the outcome um, I think was quite a contrast to the experiences we had and our members had in 2014, i.e. Uh, the write-downs that we incurred as investors were by and large erased with the sale in 2015-16. And you referred to lessons learned, that's at 5395. Under that heading, uh, you, um, 
uh, and your colleagues writing this paper said in the second sentence, refer, reflecting on the past two years, Pacific Hydro has highlighted the importance of strong governance and through the manager company uh, relationship, especially on assets which are wholly owned. Yes, that's was correct. that one of the lessons that you say came out of this? Uh, yes, so it was our observation that that relationship wasn't as clear in its allocation of roles and responsibilities as, as it could have been, uh, particularly for an asset that was wholly owned and therefore didn't have other shareholders um, as part of that dynamic. When you say the relationship, what relationship are you referring to there? So the manager, um, IFM, um, is the, the representative of the shareholder. Uh, and as that sole shareholder would engage and should engage with the board and management of the company with respect to its activities, its strategy, um, or with a review to overseeing and protecting its investment as the owner of that business. Uh, and do I understand that you say that therefore there was a sort of failure by reason of that, the fact that there was a, uh, there wasn't a distinction effectively between the shareholder and the the board of the of the investment. So it was it was our contention that by the history that the business had gone through operationally, uh, and um, some of the insights derived from the review conducted by IFM in 2014, that um, clearer alignment of responsibilities and engagement uh, could have helped um, the business um, uh, achieve better alignment with the with the interests of the investors. To be specific. Um, the business was still very much in a development phase, and yet the, the owners, by virtue of the fund investors, did not have great appetite to be putting more capital in that business. And so it was our observation, uh, there was a disconnect between management's desire, as in the Pacific Hydro management's desire, to continue to build out the development of assets, and the ultimate shareholder's desire to see the business become, or at least um, Australian Super's desire as an investor to see the business become more operationally focused and efficient. Uh, and you, in the last paragraph under that heading, you say, whilst 100% ownership of Pacific Hydro contributed to its downfall, the same sole ownership facilitated relatively swift corrective action and the freedom to implement a preferred strategy to exit. Yes, so pleasingly and, and um, somewhat impressively, the review undertaken by IFM uh, and the um, newly appointed CEO um, provided corrective action to the business. Um, they right-sized its operations, achieved operational improvement, uh, but then importantly, allowed IFM to conduct a sale process without intervention of any other owners, and so it had the sole discretion to make that, make that decision to sell the business, uh, and they did that sales process in, frankly, an exceptional way, which produced a very good outcome for investors. Uh, and, and ultimately, that paper um, concluded that it was a positive outcome for the infrastructure portfolio and for the fund? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, and in your role, and you can only talk about, obviously, your mid-risk portfolio, of which you're now... Are you tendering that document? Oh, I'm Mr. sorry. Mr Donnelly, yes, thank Australian you, Super Fisher. Investment Committee Infrastructure Portfolio Activity Report 22, March 16, ASU 0009, 045391, Exhibit 5.67. Now, in your role, and you can only talk, obviously, about the mid-risk portfolio of which you're now responsible, but looking back, would there be things that one could do differently in assessing investments? Uh, as investors, you're always learning, um, and so we constantly uh, look at what those lessons are. Um, as uh, an investment team that now make direct, in direct investments of its own account, um, we do have regard to the lessons from this and other experiences, and we seek to apply those uh, in our job going forward. Um, and I would say it's a never-ending exercise. Investing fundamentally, you don't always get right. There are always mistakes made, uh, and it's about learning from those and improving so the overall outcome uh, produces that, that proper outcome for members. And that is important, for instance, or that is why, for instance, um, we seek to invest in diversified portfolios. It's a fundamental recognition that we as investors will not get everything right. But we do try to get enough rights such that the overall outcome, which is what matters to the members, um, is the right outcome for those members. You referred there to the more direct investment. Is that also, is that also a product of scale too? Obviously the Australian super, its predecessors was at a very different stage in 1995 to what it finds itself today. Is that a, also a factor that informs how Australian super can invest? 
very much so, and particularly in the case of infrastructure where I've mentioned they're very large assets requiring very large amounts of capital. They're quite complex structurally, so your capacity to access those through auction processes or bilateral negotiations require skill. Uh, and in order to have that skill, you either enlist the services of a, a competent skilled manager like IFM, or you build that capability yourself internally. You would need scale in order to build that capability internally. Nothing further, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. President. Ellie, have you got anything, Mr. O'Brien? No questions. Thank you very much indeed. You may step down. Excused. So, 9.30 tomorrow, or Mr. Hodge, you have something? No, Commissioner, I'd be content with 9.30 tomorrow. 9.30 tomorrow it is, then. Thank you.